Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening for our Back Bay Fens Pathways project. Um, I'm Lauren Bryant, and I'm the project manager for this project. Next slide, please. Wanted to let everybody know that we are recording the meeting tonight. Um, we know that not everybody can make it for all of these meetings, so we will be posting this video of the presentation tonight onto the project website over the coming week. So if you know any friends or neighbors that are unable to join tonight, please feel free to um, send them the link for the website, which I will put in the chat a little bit later. Um, and then that way they can view it when they have a free moment. Also wanted to let everybody know that interpretation was not um, requested for this evening's meeting. We do have the ability to do translation and interpretation services free of charge for um, community meetings. So if ever that's something that you're interested in for this meeting or others, please feel free to reach out to us and we can get that set up. Thank you so much for that slide. Um, so the agenda tonight, we'll introduce our project team and we will give a project status and recap of where we are. We'll get some conceptual designs for the pathways um, and do a questions and answers session and also um, look at what our next steps are for the project. So um, as I was saying earlier, for those who um, may have just joined, my name is Lauren Bryant and I'm the project manager for Boston Parks and I apologize for my voice. I was sick over the weekend um, and I feel a lot better than I sound, um, but again, I apologize for that. Um, we are joined tonight by Kyle Zick and Mike Doucette from KZLA Landscape Architecture, and they'll be, um, Kyle will be doing our presentation tonight for you. <clears throat> so um, we often get asked, and I re reiterate this at a lot of our meetings, how design decisions are made. Um, and so we just want to make sure everybody understands that there are City of Boston priorities and um, goals that Boston Parks and Recreation have, as well as safety and regulatory guidelines, which there are a lot of on this project because we do have landmarks, um, ADA, and we also have Conservation Commission. Um, so all of those will play into decisions that we make as well. And then, of course, the whole reason that we're here tonight and all of our community meetings is to hear from the public. And obviously, everything that you guys tell us um, helps us a lot with the decisions that we make uh, during the design process. So here is a bit of an update as to where we are. I know those of you who have been at a lot of these meetings for this project know this, um, but just wanna share with everybody where we are in the process. And if you're new to the process, sort of where we've been so far. Um, we started back in the summer and fall of 2022. We had an on-site community meeting in October where Kyle led um, a small walk and looked at a lot of um, analysis and got input from the community. Then they worked more on inventory and analysis in the fall. We had a second community meeting that was virtual in January and the design team worked a lot on conceptual design. And then we had a third community meeting in February um, that was also on Zoom. And then what we realized is there's a lot to talk about at Back Bay Friends. Um, and so what we decided to do was instead of trying to shove absolutely everything into one meeting, that we were gonna do these spring meetings and have a series of three meetings where we could break it up and talk about specific, um, <clears throat> specific elements and specific parts of the park. So last week we had a really good turnout on a meeting that specifically talked about the Victory Gardens. And we'll touch a little bit on that today, but mainly, um, if you wanted to see more about that, um, that will be posted this week on our website. Um, tonight, we're going to really be talking about the overall park and pathways. And then um, in April, we'll be doing a meeting that's talking about some specific elements within the park, like the War Memorial, Evans Way Bridge, and the O'Reilly Monument. From there, we're going to be doing permitting, more design work, and I'm sure we'll have some more meetings to come back and give you guys more information, um, but we don't have those scheduled yet. And the thought is, is that we will likely start construction later this fall. Also, um, in terms of collaboration with that, what goes into a design, this project also has a lot of stakeholders, a lot of neighbors, and a lot of very interested parties. So here's just a a list of some of the organizations that we've been coordinating with and continue to try to coordinate with. 
And we were talking a little bit earlier about City of Boston priorities and parks and recreation goals. And so these are some of those things that uh, we look at when we're designing in terms of expanding walkable access to parks, heat resilience, climate, um, looking at you know, addressing equity in our parks. So that happens in every one of our Boston parks projects. We also wanna make sure that we have a diverse and balanced mix of uses. Um, and really importantly, really meaningful and inclusive community engagement, which is why we're here tonight. And then with that, I'm going to stop talking and turn it over to Kyle, who's going to talk a little bit more specifically about this project and the scope of work that we're looking at here. Thanks, Lauren. Thank so um, I'm Kyle Zick with Kyle Zick Landscape Architecture. We're the lead consultants, but we're leading a multidisciplinary team that will work um, on this project. So this project is aptly named Back Bay Fence Pathways because it focuses largely on pathways. Now that doesn't mean that that's all it is, but we'll be looking at um, things associated with the pathways, the vegetation, the lighting, the drainage, the site furnishings. But our primary focus is how do we make all the pathways accessible, make sure they follow the intended um, alignments in the user groups, that we drain the water properly, we select materials that are appropriate for durability and longevity, but also good for the environment. <clears throat> so then we'll just dive right into the specifics. Um, I'm gonna use this plan multiple times tonight. So I just wanna orient you that what's shaded in this green color is the overall limits of our Back Bay Fens project. That's the city of Boston park project. Now within that, there's um, plenty of areas to at least make note of in terms of landmarks, you know, starting with like Clemente Field, and then we have Park Drive in the Fenway, and Boylston Street, Museum of Fine Arts, the Muddy River is the blue wiggly line through the center here. Eight is the Victory Gardens. Um, and then we also have the War Memorial, the Rose Garden, basketball courts. We have a series of footbridges, a couple that exist, one on the northern edge of the MFA, one on the southern edge. And then we'll talk about the Evans Way Bridge, which used to exist, but has been removed. Um, and then the O'Reilly Monument that um, Lauren mentioned, we'll talk about in April, is up here at Boylston and Fenway. So land ownership is an interesting topic related to this project because for a park user, you don't think about this at all, but actually we have multiple landowners in this park. Uh, the simplest thing is to say, all right, the city of Boston, Parks and Recreation, own this kind of lighter orange color, which is the majority of the park. But look at the darker orange that rings it. So the state, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, owns all the pathways in the land around it because they also control Park Drive and the Fenway. And then the trust office owns the War Memorial. So it's a little complicated, doesn't make a big impact on how you will use the park or think about it, but it has an impact on us because we have to make sure who owns the land. And if, if it's not city of Boston, then we need permission to do work. So if you then translate that to the pathways, which we're focusing on the same colors that I had um, color coded the land with, we've applied to the paths. So this lighter orange are all the paths the city of Boston owns and the reddish darker orange is what DCR owns. And then that blue gray color is the Boston Trust Office. Um, I mentioned approvals, depending on who owns the land. Um, there are a number of other approvals that are required as well, and several related to wetland resources. So we've overlaid on that map I've been showing you the different wetland resources. And it starts with the Muddy River, of course, and its bank in shaded in green, it's associated bordering vegetated wetlands. We're also in a floodplain. This dashed red line shows that almost the entire project area is in the floodplain. So long story short is just about everything we propose in this project will require approval from the state, the Boston Conservation Commission and others. So when we first started the project back in the last summer and fall, we did a pretty extensive inventory and we looked at every pathway, looked at all the different components of the park. So this is a summary of the pathway conditions and green are pathways that are in good condition, red, poor, and then 
uh, yellow and orange is um, fair. So that's one thing that was important for us to just kind of take stock in and make sure as we repave, if we have to think about priorities, particularly that we take care of the fair and poor and we could retain the good ones. It wasn't as simple as that though. We we're also thinking about materials because we have asphalt paths, we have asphalt on top of concrete, we have bare earth, we have bluestone, stone dust. Um, so that plays into our decisions. And then the width is not consistent either, nor should it be based on the volume of users or the type of users. So here we're drawing on top of each one of the paths and the number represents the width in feet. So if that path that I'm circling now is nine feet wide compared to some of the, the really small paths in the Victory Garden that might be three feet wide. And then as we think about width, we have to think, all right, is it, what's the volume of users? Are maintenance vehicles or emergency vehicles using these things um, so that uh, we make sure they're appropriately sized? The other thing we made note of is if there's worn shoulders on one or two sides of the paths, because that might be indicating that the width of the path um, isn't sufficient. Or in other cases, we're finding that there's vegetation or other obstacles near the path that's causing the wear pattern off of the path. Um, after rains or during rains, we actually inventoried um, puddling on the paths. And the darker blue are major puddles. You'll see a series of dots along the DCR bike path, really. Um, that's with the angled or sloped granite curb on either side that kind of traps the water. So that is a consistent you know, puddle for any storm. We have other places. Um, and then the minor puddling is more of the lighter gray, uh, sorry, lighter blue. Now, this is only where we were focusing on puddles on paths. That doesn't, we know there are other puddles, you know, east of the, north of the uh, Rose Garden and other places. So this inventory is just about on the pathways. Kyle. Then, yes. Right, before we before we move on to things, um, I just wanted to clarify that the puddles off of the pathways, we also will be looking at and fixing as part of this project. They're just not mapped on that plan. And then the other question, there was a question um, on the boundary of the floodplain in the chat and was just wondering if before we get too far from that, if we could jump back to that really quickly. Yep. Um, the question was, Kyle, is the boundary on the floodplain reflective of the whole boundary or just that affecting the back bay fence? Well, what we've drawn here and I'm following with my cursor is what's within the limits of our project and it goes a little bit further. Um, and that's on both sides of the river. All right, so then we have a series of photos here to just give a sense of some of the conditions or issues that we're trying to improve with this project. You know, first, it's a pathway project. We're looking at pathways that are in poor condition. This is just right by the Rose Garden. This is an asphalt path on top of concrete. I know that because I can see the grid pattern of the joints of the concrete, plus the concrete sticks out in different places. Um, there's some pretty significant puddling out there. We have site furnishings that are in poor condition. We have what we call desire lines, where we see worn paths, not on our, our paved paths, indicating that people want to go, they desire to go somewhere else. So we want to either encourage those and formalize them or discourage them and block them um, in some way. I mentioned worn shoulders as well. You know, here is the diagonal path going from Jersey Street toward the northern footbridge. This is probably the most heavily used footpath that crosses the park for sure. And we have worn shoulders on both sides. Um, and that's some is the volume. We have pedestrians, we have bikes coming through here. You can see the garbage truck here as well coming through. So there's a lot of um, different users and a lot of volume here. And we also have some steep slopes. This is leading to the Southern footbridge, um, Southern edge of the Museum of Fine Arts, the Fenway is on the left-hand side. And this is a very steep slope. Um, so it's nowhere near being accessible if you were coming across the Fenway and wanted to cross that bridge. So that's something we're studying. So then um, bicyclists and bicycling. I think we've talked about this at a number of different meetings. It's you know, started right at our community site walk in October. And we heard loud and clear from the community so far that 
there's a concern about bicycle and pedestrian conflicts. So um, we really, in parks, um, Lauren has talked to senior staff at parks and basically there's Boston Parks is saying, we will not encourage bicycling across the park internally. And that bike should either be on the Fenway um, or park drive or you know, perimeter roads and then on the designated DCR multi-use path. Agassiz Road also, um, I think when it's rebuilt and restriped, will have um, designation for bicycle use. But there are other city plans that um, are pushing bikes across the park, which um, Boston Parks is not endorsing. So then um, here's a summary of what we're proposing for each path. And I'll go through this kind of topic, one, uh, color by color. And I'll use the legend to kind of keep me organized. So the dark blue are paths that are realigned or new paths. And I'll give you some examples. So up here at Boylston Street on the edge of the Victory Garden, we're actually um, raising the grade or we're proposing to raise the grade for these two paths that meet the perimeter sidewalk so they'd be accessible. And then we have a switchback path here that actually is an alternative to the very steep path that takes you down to the path along the river. Um, different circumstance over by the O'Reilly um, monument, we can widen the path there because of the volume of traffic, maintenance vehicles, those kind of things to make that wear better and accommodate the uses. And then over by the Evans Way Bridge, the other end of the park, we have some reconstructed path that would connect to the future bridge. Widened path is this thicker red. So that's the diagonal path coming across the park. We know that that has a tremendous volume of users going from Jersey Street more toward Forsyth and crossing the um, northern footbridge there. The dashed red line is a reconstructed pathway. So think of it as a path that already exists, but we're reconstructing it for a number of reasons. And I'll give you an example. As we put in the Evans Way Bridge, um, we're going to add lighting along this pathway and we're going to raise the grades slightly, um, at least at the beginning. So this concrete path, which is in fair condition, would be reconstructed um, so we could put in the new lighting and make the grades work. And then instead of it dead ending basically into the basketball court, we've got these two dark blue segments, one a desire line to the southern footbridge, but then another that would be the desire line to take you to Jersey Street if you were coming on the Evans Way Bridge. At the Victory Garden, the same color code for the path, but like the river, the path along the river, we're, we'd be reconstructing so it's just more durable and can handle, we can one, resolve the major puddling, it can handle foot traffic, but also the larger vehicles, emergency vehicles, the dumpster, um, park maintenance, those kind of things. Um, the blue color reconstructed by ACOE, that's the Army Corps of Engineers. So as part of the Muddy River Restoration Project, they've already rebuilt a number of stone dust paths. And unless we need to change that path for accessibility, and the, an example here is the Southern Footbridge where by manipulating the grades, we can make, we can actually traverse that steep slope and have an accessible route that can cross the Southern Footbridge. Otherwise we wouldn't touch these stone dust paths, the paths closest to the river. And then the last color is a pathway to remain. And those are ones mainly owned by DCR. Um, so around the perimeter of the park. But then there's a few exceptions. Um, the path that goes in front of the Emerald Necklace Conservancy um, Visitor Center, and also the concrete path that is between the London plane trees down by the river at the edge of the Clementi Field. It's in good condition. There's no reason to rebuild it. So then I'm gonna zoom in in more detail to each one of these rectangles. I'll start in area one, which will be basically from the basketball court to the war memorial. I'll show you a lot more detail and more information, and then we'll go counterclockwise around the park until we finish at the Victory Garden. And this is still, remember, schematic design, so it's very early thinking, still kind of high level, um, but we have tested the feasibility of um, grading and those kind of things. All right, so now I'll orient you to this plan since it's a little different than the plans I've showed you so far. So we have the Rose Garden here where my cursor is, the War Memorial here, the basketball courts here, and Clementi Field on the left-hand side. Muddy River is the blue shaded area at the bottom, 
Park Drive is at the top of the screen. So what are we looking at? The first thing that should jump out at you is the, are these gray lines. And these are paths that we're going to reconstruct, repave, or build as part of this project. And I'll just go through them one by one. So we would connect to Park Drive, the um, DCR pathway. And this is the path that goes to the War Memorial all the way to the Northern Footbridge. We wouldn't be changing the path, but this is, I think, mainly concrete today, but it's in poor condition. Now, along that, um, we would also remove some of the old shrubs that overhang the pathway and cause vehicles and, and pedestrians as well to go off the path to avoid those. And otherwise we would connect to the footbridge. We're gonna improve this um, diagonal path here to make sure it follows the desire line for maintenance vehicles, but also pedestrians. And we've talked to Boston Parks Maintenance staff to understand how they plow this, how they maintain it, how they mow, to get a better sense of that. The other thing I should mention as we're in kind of this quadrant, we're gonna talk more about the War Memorial on April 13th, so we'll have plenty to share then. And as part of that, these are Boston Parks owned um, floodlights that provide security and area lighting. We would update these lights as part of that project to um, make sure they're LED, they're more efficient, that kind of thing. And then also right at this northern footbridge, there's a bare uh, riverbank here that really could use some planting from an ecological standpoint and to minimize erosion. It's highly compacted. If you have a really um, keen eye, you will have noticed that the Japanese bell is not perfectly level and plumb. And it actually hasn't been since a report I read that was done in the 1970s. So we'll, look, we'll talk to the Arts Commission about having that reset. Um, it could be reset here or it could be reset in a different location if we're doing that work. So then the next path is leading to the southern side of the Rose Garden. So that is an asphalt path on top of concrete. So it's got, it's fairly old, it's in poor condition. So we would repave this generally in kind, same width. Uh, we would still have a stone dust path leaving, leading to the Rose Garden. Um, we would add a bike rack so that as people want to visit different facilities, they can secure their bike. And we're also adding, proposing to add a bench here because there's a nice, a good river view there. Existing lights would remain on that pathway. And then the diagonal path across this lawn panel would be repaved and widened slightly um, because we saw worn shoulders on both sides of the path there. Um, so we'll widen it just two feet or maybe three feet. And then we put lights along this pathway because this is so well used. And um, at night, people are still using it, but it's completely dark, even though this is the lit path. So those would be Boston street lighting owned fixtures, similar to what's along here. Um, and we have to use the fixture that Boston street lighting will re um, recommend to us. The pathway that was recently repaved, basically going across this lawn panel from the basketball courts to the Rose Garden will remain because there's no reason to replace it, it's brand new. Same with the path that's just north and parallel to the basketball courts, that was just repaved. But we would add light fixtures along this path because that would be part of the route from Jersey Street to the Evans Way Bridge. And we would repave that path to Evans Way Bridge, including this new connection. And these red lines with the dots on the end suggest that we're doing some regrading, but it's fairly minor there. The basketball court lights would be replaced, um, again, to be more up-to-date LED, better control, more efficiency. And we could also add lights to the second basketball court, which don't exist today. These green circles that I'm are showing here are proposed trees. This is a recommendation that goes back to the Emerald Necklace Master Plan and the Carol Johnson Report from the 1970s that trees should really be planted here as a buffer to separate some of these active uses and just to get more tree canopy in the park. So as you can see, as we start to zoom in, there's a lot more information here. It's pathways, but all the things related to the paths as well. So I'll go to the next panel. So Park Drive is still at the top of the screen. Muddy River cuts through the center of the screen. Clemente Field's off here to the right, and the Fenway's on the left-hand side. This area has less proposed, um, and I'll, I'll walk you through it. So here's the path 
between the Clemente Field and Muddy River. We're repaving it. It's leading to the Evans Way Bridge, and it has lighting along that path. The concrete path that goes between those London plane trees is in good condition, so we wouldn't, re we wouldn't replace it. We would add a bench. There are some shrubs, again, overhanging the pathway that we would move. And then we regrade and replace the pathways in this area where I'm pointing to. And we can make this accessible. It's very steep now. And we can realign the path going near the field house to follow the way the maintenance vehicles have to swing out to get around the building. So then we'll prevent some of the wear and tear on the landscape there. And we've been able to do this. We're shifting the path a little bit to the south. So as we do the regrading, we don't disturb any of the trees. As we swing around the river here, there is a segment of path that we're regrading to make it accessible. It was slightly steeper than 5%, which is um, the maximum allowable without handrails. And we really want to minimize adding handrails here in a historic landscape. And um, we're adding a bench. And then there's a, I think with a lot of the construction fencing with the Muddy River project, some areas where the grass was allowed to grow and some areas are now actually fairly formal meadows. And we're actually saying that's a good thing to increase biodiversity and minimize the areas that you'd have to mow. So this is an area we're suggesting could remain. Otherwise, the pathway that DCR owns along the Fenway would remain. So now the Evansway Bridge is your landmark. This is the Fenway on the bottom of the screen, Muddy River kind of winding through the middle of the screen, just a little bit of Clemente Field at the top. So on April 13th, we'll tell you more about the Evansway Bridge, different concepts and alternatives to share. But we're, we're acknowledging that we would have to rebuild um, the portion of the path that connects to that, maybe changing the grade higher or lower. We would add a light fixture and a, a bike rack at this connection. And then, as I've already mentioned, we would be replacing the path leading to Jersey Street and have lighting along it. The Army Corps has already rebuilt the stone dust path, so it's shown in that lighter gray color. But we can add some benches along the way because it's just a great place um, to stop along the way. And then this is the southern footbridge. The MFA is just off here to where my cursor is. This is the most problematic area where it's a very steep slope. If you were to cross the Fenway here, and then um, the DCR path, very steep. So what we've been able to do is make an accessible route, cut diagonally across the slope, and then diagonally back. We're raising this stone dust path a couple feet um, to be able to make this work. And, and then the direct route from the crosswalk to the bridge would have a set of stairs that would have handrails. But the accessible route is what I'm following here. But also, if you were on the stone dust path, it's still accessible. Um, to the bridge. So we were pretty happy to be able to pull this off to make this accessible and not impact any trees, which um, in an area that has a lot of trees, we thought that was pretty successful. So then the northern footbridge is on the left-hand side here. The MFA is basically just where my cursor is. The Muddy River, Fenway on the bottom of the screen, and then the War Memorial is here where I'm pointing. So we've already talked about this pathway going along the War Memorial being repaved. And this was another area leading to the northern footbridge that was slightly steeper than allowable to be accessible. So instead of doing some diagonal paths or anything like that, it wasn't really necessary. Here's a case where we could actually regrade slightly and add handrails parallel to the path, and that would be completely accessible. So it's a lighter touch, um, even with the handrails there to make that accessible. And then otherwise, the Army Corps has already rebuilt this path. I mentioned in front of the Emerald Necklace Visitor Center, that path is to remain. And in front of the Visitor Center, they already have signage and a drinking fountain and uh, bike racks as well. There are some of those older style benches that are wood and concrete base that we would replace along here. And then the Army Corps, as they pull out and move their trailers, they will restore that area. So then um, here's Agassiz Road, Fenway on the right-hand side, Muddy River to the left, and the Victory Garden on the other side. The Army Corps will still uh, re restore or reconstruct this path. They're still in the midst of that. But this path will be restored, stone dust. There's an area that we'll have to regrade to be accessible. 
Um, again, adding a bench here because of the great view with the Phragmites being removed. Um, and then there's a non-historic masonry wall here um, just off of Ag Sea Road that we would remove. Then Mother's Rest would be the landmark where I'm pointing to now, the playground. We're not touching the playground itself because it's been renovated previously. Fenway and Boylston Street is here where I'm pointing and then Muddy River is on the left. So we still have to coordinate with Army Corps to know what their intent, if they will rebuild the path that I'm highlighting now, or if we will, one way or another, it will be reconstructed. We're adding a bike rack here at Mother's Rest, and then we'll rebuild the path that leads up toward the O'Reilly and then to Boylston Street. And we'll have a curb and a low rail at the top of the hill there to direct water and to prevent the shortcutting of people going down this hill. And that would allow us then to also decompact some of the soil and make some improvements that will support those trees. And then we have this path that I'm highlighting now shown to be reconstructed as part of the O'Reilly work. One, because the granite paving that is in front of the monument has very wide joints that aren't accessible. And the path is fairly narrow and can't support emergency vehicles or maintenance vehicles. So as part of what we'll show you in April at the April 13th meeting, we have a way to make this accessible and make access to the um, monument itself and that plaza barrier free. So the last vignette I'll show you is the Victory Garden. Some of this will be um, a repeat of what we showed last week, but kind of in a different context. Uh, the Muddy Rivers on the right-hand side, Park Boylston Park Drive are on the top here. The entrance that most people think of in the Victory Garden is right here in the middle. Um, and then the, the other ways to get here um, would be off Park Drive or off Boylston here. I've already mentioned that we would regrade these two spurs and raise this intersection to make them both accessible. And then the problem area has always been, oh, this is so steep, how do we make that accessible? There's actually a wide open area here that we can make a switch back path to get around that steep section. We'd still keep the steep section for maintenance vehicles and emergency vehicles. And um, the only thing we have to study is really as you're on the bridge, what this would look like and see if we need to add any landscaping to make it more integrated. This path along the river, we would reconstruct, we would engineer it in a way that can handle the vehicles that we talked about, but still work on a day-to-day -day basis as a footpath because it's just such a great place to be now that the river has been cleaned up. Um, internal paths to the Victory Garden itself, the asphalt paths we would repave, we'd get rid of the puddles, um, and we would also create a few spur paths that would go to an accessible garden and to basically um, communal spaces, public spaces, so the apiary and the pollinator garden and the herb and medicinal garden. Um, oh, and we're proposing to add a bike rack and drinking fountain in this area, just have some more amenities and support for people to use the space. So in some of those furnishings that we're talking about, um, through the Emerald Necklace Parks, there is generally a standard bench. There, it's a wood and cast iron bench. This has been implemented, I don't know, I think we put 60 or 80 of them in Jamaica Pond. They're in the Riverway. Um, and the idea is that these would be consistent from Back Bay to Jamaica Pond. Um, and, if we were to decide we wanted picnic tables for any reason, and there's pros and cons to that, it could be complementary and of a similar style, or maybe still with hints of historic lines, but all steel instead of wood and cast iron. Drinking fountain would have a bottle filler, an ADA arm, and a, a typical arm. Uh, bike racks would be fairly simple, these um, um, posts with a circle. And then trash receptacles we're still looking at, but we know we've heard feedback about um, improving what's out there now and limiting rodent use and that kind of thing. So we're looking at different options um, and because we know that's something that you all are interested in. So as a recap to all these things that we just uh, I just talked through, um, here is a summary of the pathways that we will be working on. So that what's highlighted in red here are the ones we're anticipating will be part of this project at this point. The ones in blue, green, are what the Army Corps has done or will do. The orange is what DCR owns, and we're coordinating with DCR and we'll continue to, to see 
if they'll either have a parallel project or if there's any um, any work on DCR land that this project could afford to do. And then there's this um, greenish beige color that would be pathways to remain. So thanks so much for listening to this amount of detail. And um, I'm happy to leave this plan up and we can go back to any of the others to respond to your specific comments. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate all the time. And as you can see, this is why we broke everything up into a few different meetings, because this is a lot to take in. Um, so also, as we're going through and taking feedback, please let us know if you want us to jump back and look at any particular um, any particular uh, slides that we were looking at. So feel free to raise your hand if you've got questions. Also, um, put things in the chat as well. Um, so I guess we can just jump in. Um, Kristen, you've got your hand raised. Um, Shauna, can we let Kristen um, unmute herself, please? Is that working, Kristen, yet? Should be all set. Oh, there, there we go. go. Thank, Thank you. That. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Kyle, Lauren, everybody else who put this together. Appreciate it. Um, I wasn't able to make the Victory Garden session uh, earlier in the week, so I appreciate the opportunity to kind of come back to this space. Uh, some of my like wishes are just, I think, are what a lot of people love to see across um, all the parks. But you know, recycling we use there's a lot of picnicking that goes on in the Victory Gardens and people in their gardens. So much stuff goes into the trash, um, but we also have other trash needs, and it probably was brought before. And we have dumpsters, but really it was kind of regular ongoing and it would be great to be able to figure out how we can either recycle some of the things that we're putting in the trash or uh, having some larger receptacle somewhere in the park. I don't know how we could get that to happen, but. Um, and then I think it was covered during the session from I heard from some of my friends about, you know, placement of benches, et cetera, just being careful not to put those along garden, um, you know, fence lines, et cetera. Um, but I wonder if there's some other solution beyond what was maybe discussed the other night of kind of lower like benches instead of a big, I think it was discussed a big circle type of, um, at, at the least Victory heard maybe entrance. secondhand, but yep. like a, a larger, you know, place to sit or concrete, I'm not sure what it was made out of, but I wonder if there's other ways to kind of like get it into the landscape while still allowing like trucks to come in the park and other things. Um, I don't know. There, there's some unique things out there that are um, that maybe if we're in the grass, it wouldn't like attract skateboarders. But you know what I mean? Like something that would be invented that you can still mow around, that oh. you can't sleep on. <laughs> oh. no, thank you. There, so there's a lot there. I want to try to make sure I can um, address some of those. So in terms of recycling, I 100% agree with you. Um, recycling in Boston parks is something that we are currently working on rolling out. As you can imagine, it's not easy in the number of parks that we have to try to roll out a brand new system. So we are working on that and it's something that Boston Parks is doing. I'm not sure exactly where in the process we are on that. Um, so a lot of times what we're doing in parks is when we put in a trash receptacle because we put those on a concrete pad um, so that you know it's easy to clean, it's easy to get to. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times what we're doing is putting a wider pad so that if we're not ready for recycling when this project is installed as part of that rollout, there's a nice easy place for them to go. Um, so there's a clean space as we're rolling them out in the future. Um, so that's, again, I don't know where we are in that process, um, but that's where, um, that's what we've been trying to do in terms of that. Um, and I think for those of you who also might not have been at the Victory Garden meeting, one of the things that Kristen's talking about is we were talking about um, sort of an entry plaza space where is there a space for socializing? Is there a need for that? Um, and so that, um, and, and I agree, Kristen, we're looking at, you know, we heard a lot of comments about what that space should be, what type of benches should be there. So we're definitely looking at that area in terms of, of those benches. And I think the other thing that we did do is we pulled out from this slideshow, the benches along those um, garden edges that people had concerns about. So we did pull those out. And what we're looking at is where could those benches be to get a nice view of what's been cleaned out, but to ease those concerns that the that the gardeners had as well. So I'm not sure if we touched on everything there, but hopefully yeah. that's, that's a lot you. of it. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for joining us.
Um, Marie, I think you've got, you had your hand raised next. Let's make sure you've got, are you able to, there we go. Yep. Hi, um, this is so exciting. Thank you so much for this. Um, I kind of jotted down notes by area, so I guess I'll go through. Uh, I love the bank plantings in area one that were designated. That's a really high bird area. Whenever we do our birds of the back bay fence bird walk, that's always a really, um, that's, that's a good sighting area. So I think improving the plantings in that area is just wonderful. Um, the bike rack, I understand the placement of the bike rack near the rose garden because a lot of people do bike through specifically to see the rose garden. But I wonder about the placement so close to that, you know, shirt cliff designed circle and then the rectangular part and what's supposed to be a ring of the crab apple trees. I was wondering if it would be possible to put the bike rack across on the other side of the path to just kind of set apart the rose garden as its own um, piece of architecture. Um, I love the drinking fountains. They're so needed and the trees in, in near the basketball court is wonderful. Um, in area two, there's a bench that was proposed to be placed at the far end of Clemente Field. And I have a little concern about that because that's an area where there have been a lot of encampments and some other activities happening. So I'm not certain that that would be the best place to place a bench. However, with improved paths, you're gonna have more traffic, which changes the use. So um, just comment on that. Um, with some of the improvements of access to bridges, I wonder if there's also a way to include um, a way to deter speed just because we see not only bicycles use these paths, but the e-bikes come across. And I'm assuming that the paths are improved for wheelchair and other access and just making sure that they're going to be designed in a way that's not gonna increase conflict through high speed. Um, and then I guess I'm talking about area three now. The stone dust path that's currently um, the Army Corps of Engineers section, it's in blue on the map that we're seeing. I don't remember, but this has been so long that it's been fenced off that that blue path connects back up to the DCR sidewalk. Is that a current? So I guess my question is whether that's a current condition or whether that's going to be improved after the Army Corps leaves. Um, I'm almost done. The new tr the area near Burns, I appreciate the removal of a non-historic wall, but I do see a lot of people sit there um, to relax. There are older gardeners that are making their way back to Morville House from their garden plot. They'll oftentimes sit down and take a break because it's hard for them to do it all in one go. So I wonder if that could be an area to implement some benches. And similarly, um, there's some old mature trees near the Burns statue, but there's also some space. And I wonder with the combination of um, aging trees and available space, whether, whether we could get some new trees there as well. And I think that that's it. I love the, tra the idea of upgrading trash receptacles. And I wonder if they're, they're proposed to be put on pads because right now we just have the 50 gallon drums that are just moved around. And I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Marie. Um, Kyle, do you want to try to jump in on any of that? Yes, let me, let me respond to a few of those. So um, I think the area one the bike rack near the Rose Garden, I think that's something we'll study more. You know, I think we've kind of put a pin saying we would like a bike rack in that area, but the devil's in the details in terms of where to put that. Um, let's see. Deterring speeds with the accessibility improvements is something we've, we were certainly cognizant of. Um, at the Evansway Bridge, you know, we haven't designed this yet at all, but I think we would consider putting bollards or something to tighten up the path so that Bicycles have to slow down, but it doesn't obstruct um, wheelchairs. And the Evansway Bridge, um, we're not imagine, we're imagining it's pedestrian. You know, we're not having emergency vehicles or police cars or anything like that cross it. Then the southern footbridge, which has the steepest slope today, 
a direct route would actually have stairs. So that would actually slow down the e-bikes and bikes in general because they have to follow the accessible route, which is a little bit of a switchback. So there's some traffic calming innate in that. Um, and by adding the handrails on the path leading to the northern footbridge, I think it constricts it a little bit too. And bike handlebars, they're gonna be thinking about that and probably slowing down a little bit in that respect. Um, I appreciate the comment about the non-historic wall and benches in that area and adding trees there. And yes, we'll talk more about trash receptacles for sure. The thing on the, the 55 gallon drums is they come out seasonally, you know, so they get taken away from the, for the winter. So that provides the surplus needed for the busier seasons in the parks. But the ones we're talking about will be the permanent ones that would be year round. And we can think about what's the right mix of how many of those go out versus the barrels. Thank you, Kyle. Um, Kyle, we also did have a request in the chat if we could go back to the path materials slide. Um, there weren't any particular questions. It was just a matter of being able to take another look at it while we're all talking. Yep, and that is an inventory of existing. So it's not proposed, but this is just an inventory of materials that um, are out there today. Thank you. Um, and then, Tim, you had your hand raised next. Are you able to unmute? Perfect. There we go. Hey guys, one second. Oh, I'm trying to get my video going, but there All we right. go. We can see you. Sorry. Um, thank you again. This is uh, well. It's a lot of planning. It's really well thought out. I really like what's going on at Evans Way with the. Um, cutbacks um that's that's a nice solution um i really this is nothing you have control over you said already but when we're putting in new light fixtures um in this neighborhood uh we've kind of been stuck with cobra fixtures and really i would like to see our lighting at least live up to the rest of the standards of uh the public gardens or, you know, the commons, uh, something in that range is something that is the future, not throwing us back to having Cobra lights everywhere. Uh, I know that's not probably in your preview, but I wanted to say that anyway. Uh, and then I did not get to see the, uh, I missed last week's meeting uh, in the Fenway Victory Gardens. And I'm really concerned with activating what is a passive space that's used by hundreds of people. I mean, people come and have picnics there. They lay out their blankets, they sun. It's not, it's not a place for formalized people to sit and hang out. It's like, it's a place for people to actually enjoy nature. Like sit down, sit down on a blanket, sit down on the grass, have your picnic there's no cause and no reason for us to have enormous amount of seating for a bunch of people. You know, if, if you want to make it like it's a, a Boy Scout camp or a Girl Scout camp and you have a lecture hall there, well, that's one thing. That, that's just not what this is supposed to be used for. It's supposed to be passive space. It's supposed to be a place where people can come and enjoy nature. And if that means you have to sit on the grass, so be it. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way we're supposed to enjoy it. And I would say that if you wanted to put in some kind of gathering area, then I would look at the, uh, so the south side of the Victory Gardens, where we have that new bank and we have all that nice, beautiful open space across, away from all the gardeners and a beautiful view of the river. If you wanted to do something down there, that makes a lot more sense to me to activate that space than it does to take what we need. Because the, the space you're talking about putting in gathering things is where we have fence fest. And so then it creates problems for where you're gonna put your tents, where you're gonna put your cooking and all that kind of stuff. It's, that's really a place that's well used now as it is. And I don't think it needs a lot of changing. Um, and I would also like to reiterate um, back on the, uh, let's see, that's the, oh, 
east end of the fence. Uh, yeah, the bench in that area, I, it's, it's a good idea in a way, but the fact is, is that we still have issues down there. And when the shrubbery all grows up, it gets pretty thick down in that area. And that's what causes our problems with uh, uh, folks that are homeless that need a place to stay and they do find shelter there. And that's, that's, the, that's a concern. Um, outside of that, I really uh, like what you guys have, are doing. I don't necessarily um, like to see more asphalt put on top of my parkland, <laughs> but I can understand that if we need to have ADA compliant paths so that people can get into public spaces, that's okay. Um, but seriously, I, I, you know, I don't like seeing that take over. I don't want to see the Victory Garden paths more formalized. I really like the idea that they are wood chipped and that folks actually use them uh, just as normal gardeners would use them rather than having them everything formalized. Um, it's, it's just, it breaks with tradition. Anyway, that's just me. Uh, thank you guys a lot for letting me talk. And really, I think you're doing a great job. I, I really would like to say that uh, the last time these stone paths were done, I think it was 2008 and Marco Baldessario and um, Ms. Madison got together and got that to work with the DCR to get all those pathways improved through Fenway Civic back in 2008, 2010. And really they've held up pretty well. And I really think that the stone dust paths, um, if they're properly done and cared for, they really do work. Um, and I'd like to see you guys kind of keep on that kind of material that's pervious and that is easily uh, replaced and re easily fixed. So thank you very much for everything. I, I really do appreciate all this hard work and everybody's time, thank you. Thank you, Tim, I appreciate all those comments and two things I just wanted to respond to on that is we definitely hear you on the Cobra lights and the plan is to um, try to work with Boston Street Lighting on when the lights were adding in and replacing what's out there with the acorn fixtures, which would be more um, consistent like you were talking about. And then also um, appreciate the comment about that activated space in the gardens. And it's one of the reasons that we show that because we had heard, you know, like we do in a lot of community processes where we sort of hear both ends of the spectrum of people wanting a place to gather and others not. So it's good to be able to hear both sides of that. So I really appreciate it. Um, George, thank you all for everybody that has your hand raised. Thank you for your patience. There's a lot to get through tonight. Um, George, I think you should be able to unmute yourself. Thank you very much. Um, some health problems kept me from a uh, more frequent presence at these meetings. And so I just want to say that I was really thrilled by the good news that, I, that came out of Kyle's report uh, this evening. And I was most deeply thrilled, I have to say, uh, by the news that something will be done to uh, deal with the steep slope at footbridge number two at the south end there. Uh, my wife and I are 81 years old and like many residents here, uh, for us, the best way to get downtown now that the 55 bus is basically irrelevant to the realities of our neighborhood uh, is to go across there to the, to the 39 bus and the green line at the museum. And that steep slope, we were lucky this winter because it wasn't so bad, we could still haul ourselves up it. But in, in, in any inclement weather, it's, it's really tough. And so the fact that you have that as part of the plan to deal with is wonderful. And I just hope it's a high priority, um, but uh, I know you'll get to it uh, in time. And as I say, I'm thrilled. That's really all I have to say, except congratulations on your wonderful work. Thank you, George, really appreciate the comments. Jack, I think you were next with your hand raised. Sorry. Yeah, hi, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I want to echo the sentiments that you all are doing a really amazing job on this project, and it's appreciated. And thanks for all this time doing the community engagement as well, because I think it's beneficial. Um, a few things that I thought in, as Kyle went through the presentation, I'm curious of some of the shrub removals along the pathways. It makes sense if they're encroaching on the space 
I'm wondering if any of them could possibly be replacements instead of removals, but I haven't you know, looked too closely into any of that. I was also really intrigued by the meadows that you all have outlined. I think that they could be really nice spaces and good for biodiversity. I was curious about the longer meadow that was kind of on the more southern part of the park in area three along the Fenway, because that seems to be in an area of jurisdictional complication, because I know that I think that's kind of the transition zone from DCR to Boston. So I'm curious about you know maintenance for that area. And in general with the meadows, I, I'm wondering if those are going to be just mowed spaces or if there's any room for some plantings for native pollinator species or anything like that. But I know that that all requires maintenance and complicates your lives. Um, so I'm cur just curious. Um, a few other thoughts I had are that we've been hearing, I guess when we have cleanup events with the Conservancy and we get other reports, it seems like trash often will accumulate a bit near benches, which makes sense because people can be lazy. Um, so I wonder if there are opportunities to locate some of the trash receptacles closer to benches. Um, I also want to raise Sarah Freeman's point in the chat about whether there could be a counterflow lane on Agassiz Road for bicycles, because my intuition tells me that many people are going to do that regardless. So making that safe sounds um, worthwhile to me. And then I know it's a long list, apologies, but the one other thing I thought was that I was grateful for the decompaction work or the opportunity for that around the mother's rest site. I know that the playground there um, for little kids can be the kind of hot spot in the summer, like hot temperature wise. And I wonder if there could be opportunity for some, some plantings or shade trees in that area because um, I think the condition of the hillside has occluded that to date. So if we can help with that, maybe we could get some trees in. But thank you all so much and thanks for listening. Thank you, Jack. Kyle, do you want to try to jump in on any of this? Yep. Yeah, starting with shrub removals and replacement. Um, I think replacement will be something we'll look at. I mean, generally, where we had removals, one, it's an encroachment on the path, but it's also a remnant of a former design idea, you know, by the um, Victory Garden or some places that some of the yews or junipers just aren't part of the larger idea anymore. So that's something we'll look at as part of the war memorial. And then um, over by the field house at Clemente Field, there's just some stray shrubs that may have been part of something at one point, but now we're just kind of isolated shrubs. But I think your point is taken, you know, if, if we're removing shrubs that potentially have some value in terms of habitat or even seasonal interest, we can look at places to add. Then the meadows, um, the two meadows that we were talking about, one where I'm pointing now and one through here, I'm not sure about the second one in terms of jurisdictional issues. The DCR land ownership stops at the edge of that multi-use path, and then it would be city of Boston. So the meadow would be city of Boston. Um, particularly in the fall, I did see it with pollinator species because goldenrod was pretty, um, it was uh, heavily uh, vegetated with goldenrod. So we're still imagining herbaceous plants in the meadow that could be mowed once a year just to keep the woody materials down. Then um, thank you for the information on the trash near benches, that's helpful to know. Um, and also the information about adding trees uh, near the Mother's Rest Playground. The counterflow lane at Agassiz, that's a DCR road. So while we're coordinating the DCR, we've talked to them about Ag Agassiz and I know they were in conversations with the Army Corps about what gets put back when it gets repaved, but I don't know of the final decision on that. My understanding, Kyle, is that that conversation is still in the works and that they're still having meetings on it, and I haven't heard anything about any decisions one way or another, but they definitely um, have heard what we have heard from you all because we've been relaying that to them. So, but as soon as we as soon as we hear anything, we'll make sure that we incorporate it into some of our next meetings too. And I think um, Kathleen, I think, was our next person with her hand raised. And again, I appreciate everybody's patience. There's there's a lot of you here, and you guys all have such great thoughts. Hi, thanks. Uh, I just have um, three comments, but first of all. Thanks so much. This is really phenomenal. The level of detail and the considerations going into this. I had a question about 
the lighting. It seems that we're adding needed lighting. Um, I'm a little just, it's more of a question as to light levels, um, you know, a concern about light pollution in, in general. I know there are safety issues, but just concerned about the light levels in general. Um, the second conversation about the trash and the recycling, I think, um, you know, I'm on Rambler Parks board and also I have, um, I volunteer a lot at a beach community area. And at the beach, we took the trash barrels out because we try to encourage people to do carry in, carry out. And that's probably not um, possible all, all the time here, but it, it was a stunning success. I, I couldn't believe it. I'm thinking on the side to the south of Clemente, um, you know, if there were, if we kept that more natural with less benches, less trash, whatever, and, and you know, maybe the central part is where you might locate the trash. Um, and I think that really, I, I would try to encourage the carry in, carry out mentality. I don't know how realistic it is, but I'm just throwing it out there. And the third thing, um, again, is like, my feeling is less is more here. It's such a small place. And I kind of cringe at the thought of adding more benches, more pavement, et cetera, et cetera. And my idea of less is more, you know, the beauty of the place. I love the idea of the added trees. I think, especially in the south of Clemente, if you just, I'm, I'm thinking of elderly who would need a bench position maybe to get through that path for a rest stop. But otherwise, it would be so nice just to keep it clear and open. Um, overall, fantastic. And thank you so much. Those are all my comments. Your first comment. Oh, go ahead, Lauren. Sorry. No, sorry. Go ahead, Kyle. Uh, the lighting and light pollution, it, it's a good point, and it's something we're certainly cognizant of. And I think we heard it even at the first site walk, you know, in terms of um, lighting for safety, but also being cognizant of lighting's impact on wildlife. So we're, we're going to have to have more conversations with street lighting. I mean, generally, they are fairly, they're very straightforward. They're like, you, you will use our standard fixture if you want us to own it. So um, while their fixtures, the acorn light has gotten better in terms of control, um, you know, it's still, it's got limitations in terms of its control for light pollution. Um, trash and, uh, Lauren, maybe you can talk about carry in, carry out. Um, and I appreciate the comment about less is more. You know, it's always the, the balance in a project like this to make sure you're accommodating the users, but not to, but still remember the essence of the place and, you know, to have a light touch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of the carry in, carry out, it's definitely something that we've looked at with the Parks Department in general. It's, it's our policy in our urban wilds in Boston Parks. Um, and typically we found that when a park is used as a destination in terms of that's pretty much the only reason that you go there. Um, that tends to work out really well with the carry in carry out when it's used for kind of commuting and we know a lot of students walking through getting back and forth to things. It's not always as successful as it is um, in, in a beach location or an area like an urban wild um, or a national park. Um, but it's definitely something that we've looked at. So it's a really interesting thought. Um, and Allison, thank you. I know that um, you had your hand raised next as well. I know you put it down already because I had muted you, so. <laughs> okay, um, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I might have missed all these uh, early comments because I joined late. Um, I appreciate George's comment about um, dealing with the uh, steep slope by the MFA. Um, and, but I do echo that um, less is more and worried about the percentage of asphalt that's going to be added and wondering if you could do a comparison at some point of how much asphalt is there now with what you will be adding. Um, and my question from maybe two meetings ago um, that uh, the site survey was going to be posted, but I haven't seen that yet. So the survey was going to show the locations of existing trees and that's really helpful to think about whether 
any existing trees are going to be impacted by um, some of this construction work. Thank you. Thank so you. The, so the percentage of asphalt is something that we will um, calculate because a part of our environmental permits will have to calculate the uh, the area of impervious impervious surfaces. So what areas um, are permeable and what aren't. And if we increase the impervious, the ones that don't um, drain or infiltrate, we'll have to um, treat that water. Um, and so, so I think there's two different issues. There's a stormwater and drainage piece of it, but then there's also you're adding asphalt, which is you know a petrochemical based material, not natural based. So, and we're cognizant of that, but we also know that Boston Parks. Um, what Boston Parks can maintain and what they can't maintain, and what they can't maintain. So we're, there's the balance of having the right materials in the right locations, and to make sure if we, to, if we were to add asphalt, add a path, that we can treat that water in a way that doesn't have any impact on the Muddy River. Um, the site survey, um, I want to point out the, your comment about the existing trees. Um, the site survey is from an aerial survey, so it's aerial photography digitized, it generally has the tree locations pretty well because um, we've been testing it along the way. It's not gonna show every single tree. Sometimes it'll just be an outline of a cluster of trees. But particularly I can tell you like, as we look at these accessibility improvements where I'm highlighting now by the field house over here um, at the end of the project, the footbridges or even in the Victory Garden, we're very carefully paying attention to where the trees are because we wouldn't show you, we don't wanna show a solution that will require tree removal. Um, you know, it's been a message from Warren from the get-go, you know, as you start to develop these studies and, you know, we haven't shown you, like we did eight different studies for the Southern footbridge improvement. And we feel like there's one that accomplished the goal in terms of accessibility that didn't require tree removal. So that's something that we're very conscious of. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. And Kyle, did we have, and I know you and I have looked at it, but did we have a diagram in this slideshow that showed what the new pathways were? Because I know you and I looked at that recently. Because yes. I think that it looks like a lot of paving because there's already a lot of asphalt. There's already a lot of pathways out there. But what we're talking about adding is actually not, in. in in comparison with what's there, we're not talking about adding huge swaths of it. So I just wanted to also share this one again while we're all looking at it. Yeah, the dark blue are new paths, but there's an explanation behind some of them. You know, so it, truly paths that are brand new that don't exist today would be the diagonal here. And that's a little bit just a different alignment of something that exists. That's a desire line that's worn earth. This is a new path. These two paths exist. These are new paths in the Victory Garden, and that switchback is a new path. Otherwise, everything else is just modifying what's there. And I think that, Kyle, what we might want to do, because that, that comment had come up quite a bit, is maybe we should have a diagram for our next meeting that really truly shows this is the only places that we're talking about putting in paths that weren't there previously. And I think that could help with that, with yep. some of the questions too. Um, but so thank you for that. And Steve, thank you um, for your patience too. And I know you had your hand raised as well. Uh, thanks, Lauren. Uh, two questions about what you did say and two questions about some th things you didn't say or haven't covered. Um, in that first category, I second Kathleen's concern about light getting appropriate light levels and reducing light pollution. I'm glad that you folks are thinking about that. And I'm hopeful that the plan includes, and it was a little hard for me to, to parse this when the map came up, but I hope, hoping the plan includes or placing those few humongous out of scale street lights that are lining the path in the Victory Garden just east of Boylston Street, not the, not the DCR sidewalk, but the inner path, um, which were put in as quote unquote temporary lighting in 30 years ago. Um, and then um, I, was, I was very excited to see the new trees that you're proposing along Clementi Field. 
I would just ask if there might be other opportunities in other places to add to the tree canopy, um, just as sort of an open-ended question. The two questions or comments about things that you didn't address is, I know it's probably out of the purview of this study, but is anything gonna happen to that field house, which seems like such a missed opportunity? Is there anything that is this plan does to make that just a little more appealing other than making it easier to get from the street down to the that path that runs along the river? That's one question. And then the other question is there, there was no comment and maybe gets again, sort of out of purview, but the, I guess it's called Forsyth Park, that little triangle with the John Endicott statue. Um, I, I didn't really hear much about it. Um, and the only, my only comment would be these enormous yew trees or bushes, I guess, that are next to the statue have become a kind of dumping ground. If you look underneath them, you will see dozens, if not hundreds of you know, bottles, plastic bottles, beer cans, stuff. And obviously nothing you can do will stop that. But I just wonder if they're 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 they are like the ones near the more war memorial. These they become massive, dense, <laughs> uh, almost almost like solid, visually solid, certainly, um, pieces of the landscape. And I'm just wondering if you had given any thought to that area or if as I say it's kind of out of the zone that you're looking at. Sorry, that was so long. Do you want me to, do you want me to address the last one? And then uh, you can- which, Whichever ones you can. Kyle, you can do the others. That sounds good, Laura. So um, the, some of you may have noticed if you were um, paying a lot of attention to this slideshow versus the other, the area that Steve's talking about is now colored on our plans and it has not been in any of our previous projects or any of our previous meetings. And the reason that is, is because there is a possibility that that portion of the park system will be pulled into this project. So Kyle is looking at that in terms of analysis, in terms of our surveys, in terms of a lot of those things you were just talking about, Steve, but we're not talking about it yet because it's not for sure that it's gonna come in. So that's an iffy, it might be part of our purview, it might not. Um, the field house in particular is not part of the scope of this, but Kyle, I don't know if you've had any thoughts about, you know, some of the other just aspects of that that um, Steve was talking about in terms of just making it a little nicer. Yeah, I think there's definitely opportunities around the field house cleaning it up. There's been a lot of things added and nothing removed over the years. So there's drinking fountains that don't work. There's, you know, broken this, that, and the other. So I think we can just freshen it up to make it look cared for and um, new again. The building itself, from what I understand, is more of a shell than anything. It's not what it used to be in terms of a field house. There's a transformer back in there, but I don't think there's habitable space. Might now, also um, be a case that some a little additional landscaping, a few extra trees around there would sort of soften the way it kind of you know stands out. Yep. Some of your other comments. Um, the Victory Garden lights, I know that came up at the Victory Garden meeting and Lauren, I think you had commented that one, we'll, the, we're definitely gonna underground the wires, but um, those temporary lights, 30 year temporary lights, we would look to um, change those out to be similar to the, the Boston street lighting standard, the acorns. Um, oh, and while we're here, because you mentioned what haven't you mentioned? And one thing I meant to point out the duck house, not that we're we're not doing anything with the building itself, but the Army Corps has been doing a lot of work here and they're very actively in this area. So we don't show any paths here. Historically, there were some paths here, but I think as the Army Corps starts to pull out and we can see this area again, this is an area we should look at to see there's gonna be fantastic views. It's underutilized. So is there an opportunity to add a path? Um, and I think that also would be in concert with what happens with Agassiz Road um, that there could be a spur or a loop here to actually take advantage of that space. Thank you, Kyle, and thank you, um, Steve, for those questions. Um, Pam, um, do you want to jump in? You, you've got your hand raised as well. Hi, thank you, and of course, thank you for the work you're doing. Um, I sent you a rather long email this morning. I'm not going to repeat all of it. 
Um, but a couple comments on the switchback. I think that's a lovely place to put benches. Um, I am a bit concerned about in the triangle above the switchback. There's a lot of trees there, and I don't know how raising the path and raising that corner is going to affect the existing trees. And I know Jack has plans on planting for planting more trees there. So I just want to put that out as a concern, but I don't know anything more to say about it. Um, my next question is going to be um, within the Victory Gardens, a little spur row, little spur paths that go to the handicapped accessible areas. Um, would you consider doing those not in asphalt, but instead of stabilize, instead using stabilized stone dust? Just a question. Um, and are there other, I suspect I might miss this at the beginning of the meeting, are there other permeable surfaces that are being considered for pathways um, or other surfaces at all besides the asphalt? And one final comment, someone from DCR once told me that Trash barrels attract trash, and that's why DCR has removed them from much, many of their properties. Um, I think that that is consistent with um, if it's a destination location, carry in, carry out works. We clean up trash left by someone who has been sitting in the gardens or sleeping in the gardens or shooting up in the gardens probably once a week, a fairly big portion, fairly big pile of trash. And that's a disposal problem for us. It's become more so a disposal problem with the new state law that says you can't put fabric in trash. I mean, there was Saturday morning, a, two people popped out of a tent and wandered off, leaving the tent and sleeping bags there. Um, I called both the park ranger, I called the park rangers who said that, and the police um, who said they'd try to get it removed. And as of Monday, it was not removed. I don't know if it was removed today. But we will have something like that happen um, probably about once a week, maybe not always a tent, but certainly blankets, clothing, shoes, it's an issue for us. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate all of those comments. Kristen, you've got your hand raised. Thanks. Um, there's a comment made about the, the duck house. Um, there are some folks on, who are on this call uh, that are involved in the community where I was gonna catch up with them, but there is a, a movement underway to do something there. Um, so um, we're early stages, but uh, I think that, you know, in, in the coming years, uh, we'll be able to reactivate that space. That would be wonderful. Having, having those spaces used is huge. Mm -hmm. It'd be a, like a huge win for the neighborhood, so. I'm looking forward to hearing about that in the future. <laughs> um, well, I think we I think we finally got through our backlog of people who had their hands raised. So thank you guys all for your patience. Um, there was a question in the chat that just popped up that says, is there a friends of the Back Bay Fence group? So not that I am aware of, um, Richard, that's a great question. Um, if there are people that are interested, we have somebody at the office whose job it is to help coordinate friends groups and help those get set up. And unfortunately, we just lost her to um, BPDA, but we are rehiring somebody for her position now. Um, and once that person is um, in, their, in their new spot, I'd be happy to connect people. So Richard, if that's something you're interested in, if anyone else is interested in that, um, I can also um, connect all of you as well. I'm going to, um, again, for those of you who may have joined a little bit later, I am going to put my email address in the chat, and I'm also going to put the parks um, or the Back Bay Fens project website in the chat as well um, for anybody who needs those. Um, and yes, Pam, I'll definitely let you know when Christine's replacement is hired for sure. Um, we're all looking forward to that. Um, while we're all here, I want to be respectful of everybody's time, but is there anybody else that has any other thoughts or questions or wants to um, see any more of these um, slides while they're up? Also wanted to just say for anybody who may not have gotten an email directly from me, I believe I should have them um, from registering for this meeting and I can add you to um, next meetings. Um, email, but if you want to feel free to send me an email, make sure you get on that list. 
Um, and also just as a reminder about our April 13th meeting um, that we'll be sending out Zoom links for that's specifically looking at, sorry, my throat, um, specifically looking at the War Memorial, Evans Way Bridge and the O'Reilly. And then there's also the QR code for the project website as well. So again, thank you all. Really appreciate the feedback and your time. We know there's a lot to talk about and there's a lot here, um, but I love all the passion and um, everything that you guys tell us about the park. So very much appreciated.